All right, here we are this morning in probably the most famous chapter in the entire Bible, John chapter 3. Amazing chapter on uh, salvation, and it's really just a core tenet of, of, of the faith, of, of Christianity, of, of salvation, of Jesus Christ, of what he taught, is found here in John chapter 3. And the reason why I started off with this this morning is because in John chapter 3, he's explaining to Nicodemus the concept of being born again. Being born again. And, um, you know, look down at verse number 3. Or look at verse number 2. It says, The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. So here he is. Here's a man. He sees, you know, some of these things that, that's going on with Jesus. And, and he goes to him privately and he questions him, saying, you know, you've done all these miracles. And there's no way that you could be doing all these miracles unless you were sent from God. Which is a completely different attitude than, than the, the, the reprobate Pharisees that just completely rejected Jesus and were saying that he was doing it through the power of the devil. Right? Here's a man, here's a Pharisee, Nicodemus, that came to Jesus and said, it's evident. I can see what you're doing. And this is historical fact. What Jesus was doing and the miracles he was performing was done in such a way. And, and it's so wonderful and it's so great. I mean, we live in the year 2016 based off of Jesus Christ. I mean, the years, 2,000 years later, we're still just counting the days, counting the years from the birth of our, Jesus, of our Lord Jesus Christ. The impact that he had on the world is phenomenal. And the fact that Christianity still uh, is around today, I mean, the things that he was doing, you can't just overlook this, right? He was literally going around and healing people and raising people from the dead and, and, and doing all these great, wonderful miracles that was evident by all the people around at that time. And it's historical fact that he was doing these things. But look at what he says in verse number three. So he comes to him and he says, look, I, we know that you got to be from God. And he's basically asking him, what, what do you have for me? What, what can you teach me? Verse number three, Jesus answered and said unto him, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He's saying, if you want to go to heaven, you want to see the kingdom of God, you got to be born again. Verse number four, Nicodemus doesn't understand this. He says, Nicodemus saith unto him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? So he doesn't get what he's saying at all. He has no comprehension of what Jesus is trying to teach him here. He's saying, well, wait, what are you talking about born again? You know, I've got a birthday. I'm an adult now. I'm a grown man. You think I could go back inside of my mother's womb and just be born a second time? He's thinking in the flesh. He's thinking physically, right? And obviously that would be ridiculous. But Jesus answers him in verse number five. Jesus answered, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit. He cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So now he gives a little bit more clarification. He says, yeah, you need to be born of the water and of the Spirit. Now, many people will falsely teach that when he says born of water, that that means you need to be baptized, be baptized in water. Well, it doesn't say baptized in water. It says you need to be born of water. And the word of in the Bible means almost all the time it's going to mean from, right? It's, it's born of or born from water and of the Spirit or from the Spirit. And then he clarifies it even more in verse 6. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. There's two births. One birth of water, one birth of the Spirit. There's two births. One birth of flesh, one birth of the Spirit. Now, the flesh birth is literally when the mother's water breaks at the time of delivery of the child. It's a physical birth. We've all experienced that in this room. We're, we're here, we're breathing. I know for a fact that everybody's experienced that birth in this room today. That's the first birth. But the second birth he's referring to is a spiritual birth, right? That is when we're born into God's family. And he says, Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. And he goes on and on, and he basically gives them the gospel, and he's telling them, you know, you know, the famous verse in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And he goes, I mean, it's a great chapter to show, buddy, show people salvation. But what I want to preach about this morning here 
It's Jesus mentions here being born again. You have to be born again. And in John chapter 1, it explains that as, but as many as received him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. When you're born, you become a child of your parents. When you're born again, when you're born spiritually, you have a father in heaven. Your father is the, is, is the Lord. From heaven, he becomes your father. You are born into that family. And we're preaching about this morning the benefits of being born again. All the things that go along with that. See, we have a tendency to preach a lot on what is wrong and what's sinful and the things that, you know, all these problems in the world. And for very good reason. We do that a lot in this church. Okay? But sometimes it can wear on you, and we need to make sure that we stay balanced on everything that's in the Bible. You know, obviously we need to preach on the sins, because if you're not preaching on it, then for one, people aren't going to realize that you're doing something wrong. We need to be able to correct ourselves. We want to be able to, to move forward and do what's right. And we need to call out the wickedness and be able to watch out and beware. And there's all, you know, there's all these traps and, and, and all the things we have to look out for in this life. But it can become overwhelming. If that's all you ever hear is how bad and how terrible and how horrible everything is, I mean, it could really start to wear on you. Start thinking like, man, why are we even here? What's going on? And trying to live the way that people in churches like ours, you know, independent, fundamental Baptists, we try to hold ourselves to a real high standard. You know, we really care and love God's word. We want to do what's right. So we, you know, we push hard and, and, and really try to make sure that we're doing everything the way that we're supposed to be doing, the way that God expects of us. But again, it may get a little overwhelming at times. So we need to balance that off and, and take a step back and remember and what we're preaching today, remember that we're in a family. We're in God's family. I'm going to preach some of the benefits of being born again. I mean, think about it. It's like training physically. This is the way that I like it in my mind. When you're training for something physically, you have this goal in the future. I did sports in high school. I was a, a competitive swimmer. I did that for, I don't know, 11, 12 years of my life. And um, very tough, very grueling sport. It's very, very tough physically, and it's very, very tough mentally. It's one of those sports where it's pretty individual, and you have to be able to push yourself if you're going to succeed. Now, you have this goal in the future, and you know when you're competing, you've got a big event coming up you know, later on in the year or whatever, and you're kind of working towards a goal. And sometimes it could just feel so far away, and you're continuing to grind through your grueling practices, and while you're doing this, your body is slowly strengthening. But each individual day, you don't realize that. You don't feel like it, that's for sure. You feel like you're worn out and exhausted and ready to die when you're really working hard. You, you, you actually start to feel weaker as you're going through this without even realizing that, no, you're, you are getting stronger. And that's one of the important things of being able to, to time yourself and do the different things, the metrics to show yourself that you are improving, you are getting better. Because if you didn't do that, you'd just be thinking, man, I'm just, I'm killing myself and, and working so hard and things are just so difficult and you just feel like you're going nowhere and you're going to be ready to give up and just ready to quit. Sometimes we need to be able to take a step back and understand why we do what we do. It's also good to remember that our flesh is weak, Right? But thank God that the Spirit is willing. When we have that Spirit that's born again inside of us, that will help us to get that drive. Now turn, if you would, to John chapter 8 real briefly. John chapter 8. The reason we do what we do is because of the family that we are in. If you're wondering, why do you Baptists always, you know, fundamental Baptists, why are you always following the rules so closely? Why do you care about God's law? You know, aren't you, don't you know where we're free from the law? Why do you make such a big deal about all these different things? Why do you make such a big deal about all the things that are going on in the world? Why do you have to call out this sin? Why do you have to, to, to make yourself look weird in the public's eye? Why do you have to say these things and, and, and get ostracized by the public and, and, and all these different things? Why, why do you have to do that? Well, it's because of the family that we're in, because we're in God's family. Look at John 8, verse number 38. Jesus is speaking to, to some of these Pharisees that rejected him in John 8, 38. He says, I speak that which I have seen with my father. And ye do that which ye have seen with your father. He's saying, I'm just doing the things of my father. I'm of my father's household and I'm doing all the things that he told me to do and everything that he does. I follow it. I learn from him and I'm doing what my father taught me to do. He's saying, you do what, you, what you've seen with your father. They answered, verse number 39, and said unto him, Abraham was our father. 
Jesus says unto them, If ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. And he's teaching them here that the, the son is known basically whether or not they're just like their father by their works, the things that they do. Are you really your father's son? And what he's referring to here, he's not talking about their physical seed because earlier in the chapter he says, look, I know that you're Abraham's seed. Physically. He, he's, he doesn't care about the physical though. What makes you a child of your parents is not whether or not you were necessarily physically born in their family. He's saying it's what you do. Are you doing, are you following in the path, in the steps that your, that your father has set forth for you to do? He says, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. He said, Abraham was a good guy. He was a righteous guy. He followed God. He, he, he commanded his household well. But you're not doing the works that Abraham did. So you are not of your father. Look at verse number 40. But now ye seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. Ye do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do ye not understand my speech? Even because ye cannot hear my word, ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And he calls them out and says, you're of your father the devil. They're trusting in the fact that they were physically Abraham's seed. They're trusting in the fact that they believed that they were God's children. But he's saying, no, you're not. No, you're not. If you truly were a son, if you truly were a son of God, you wouldn't be doing this. You wouldn't be, be railing on me. You wouldn't be plotting to have me killed. You wouldn't be doing those things as a son. And the reason why we do what we do and we try to do the things that we do in this church is because we are in this family. We are in this family with Jesus. Now the problem that many people have with the Bible in general and this applies to, I think, just about everybody, is our lack of understanding. It really mostly will just all boil down to a lack of understanding. If you're being honest, if you're looking at the Bible and you say, you know, there's things in here that, that may not have any benefit for you whatsoever. Sometimes people even think that there's things in the Bible that are going to hinder you, that are bad for you if you follow these things. It's a lack of understanding. Because everything in the Bible is good for you. Every word of God is pure. Every word of God is true. And it really is just a lack of understanding. And I'm going I'm to apply it this way. You know, being in the family, if you're born again, you're a child of God. Now, I have rules for my children. And anyone who's been around me knows that that's true. And I swear they must think sometimes that I'm just trying to be mean to them. Because I tell them, no, I'm the no man in the family. I'm the no man. Can we do this? No. Can we do this? No. No. Can we watch this? No. Can I listen to this? No. Now, I'm not trying to be mean to them, but that's probably the perception that they have sometimes. I wouldn't doubt it. They won't understand many things until they start to get older and gain more wisdom and start to get a little bit more understanding. The rules that I make for my children, they may seem strict to a lot of people too out there in the world. I, they, I might look like this real strict father. And I'm sure that they are strict in the world's eyes. You probably would look at me and say, yeah, he's real strict. But the reason for the rules is because of how much I really love my children. It's not because I want to be mean to them. It's not because I want to hurt them. It's because I love them. Now, children, please believe me when I say this. You may think you understand all the reasons why your parents do things. But you don't yet. You might think you know, but you don't. And, and, and you know what? The reason why I know that is because I was a child too. I remember what it's like to be a child. I remember what it's like to think that I knew everything. And I remember hearing similar things being told to me and saying, no, you don't really know. No, you don't really understand. And it's a common thing among all children to kind of think that way, to be thinking that, no, you, you, but you don't understand why my situation is a little bit different. You don't understand what's going on with me. Yes, I do. And yes, adults do. And people who have been around for a while, no. People who were child, children once and are grown now, we know what it's like. We know the problems that you face. It doesn't matter how, how the culture changes as much. It doesn't matter what things are going on externally. We know what the struggle is like. We know what things you're going through. And 
when you don't understand what your parents are doing and why they're doing When you have a loving family, you have loving parents, you don't understand why they're doing things, it's just because you need to get a little bit more wisdom and understanding. There are things that come with time that you can't rush through. You can't just absorb everything all at once. There's nothing wrong with being a child, but a child needs to grow. It, it's, just, it's a fact of life, and it's something that you need to be patient with and learn how to get through. There's many things that you simply can't understand until you get much older. There are certain things that I didn't even understand until I became a parent. And I didn't become a parent until I was in my 30s. I mean, there's just certain things. Until my child was born, there's things I just didn't, I couldn't fully grasp and completely understand until I had a child there. The, the, just being a father and being a parent. There's a lot of things that you learn and you could understand a little bit and get a little bit of a feel for it, but until you actually uh, uh, see your child, that the, this small, helpless little life that needs you to raise them and, and they have a whole life ahead of them and that your job is to teach them and to train them and to bring them up and do all these things for them, you don't realize what impact that has on your life until, you, until you're there. And there's a lot of things that you gain through time. Take it from someone who's already been through that time in life. I'm only 39 years old. You might say only. Well, you know, <laughs> I'm only 39 years old. And I am, I'm honestly excited to get older. Because I can already see the amount of learning that I've got, you know, the, the wisdom and the knowledge I've received in my short years. And every year, and I could think back of the things I knew 10 years ago, 20 years ago. And I, I look, because I, I can look at kids now that are like 20, 21, 22 and to me, they look like children, like just, I mean, really, really young. And I'm not saying that to be mean or anything like that. It's just the, the amount of understanding that is there when you're at that age is still so far, you know, the, and, and this is why the Bible puts such an emphasis on honoring the older people. You know, honor the elders, honor the people, you know, the hoary head, you know, rise up before them. People gain wisdom through time, through years. And even as a child, however old you are now, think about how much more you know than you did five years ago or two years ago. You know, I mean, the, the, you, you, could, you could see the growth. You can see how much is there. I remember some things from my own childhood. I remember being a teenager and being so mad at my parents when I was 13 years old because they wouldn't let me go to Metallica concert with my friends. Now, I was not raised, obviously, in an independent fundamental Baptist church. Okay, I was really worldly, but, um, you know, it was what it was. But you know what? I thank God that my parents still loved me enough to have rules for me. They loved me enough to say no. I didn't understand it at all at the time, and I kind of threw a fit about it. I was being a little brat about it. I was a jerk. I don't, I don't remember exactly everything I did, but I kind of shunned them for like a week. And I remember it was right, it was in December and you know, the concert was coming up and you know, all of my friends, they can all go and their parents would let them go, but not me, right? I was the odd one out. I wasn't allowed to go there because, you know, I was like, well, what do you think could possibly happen to me at a Metallica concert? When I'm 13, I could take care of myself. Yeah. I thought I knew. I mean, I, I thought I, I, I could handle myself. I'm going with some friends. Nothing's going to happen. Now, they did end up compromising on that. My, my dad ended up taking me. And I think they shouldn't have even done that the way that I acted. Never should have even done it. And then came spring break. I was a senior in high school, right? 17 years old. Now I'm a lot older, right? I, now I really know what's going on. All my friends are going to Cancun, Mexico. Good idea, right? Send, send the teenager off to Mexico for spring break. Yeah, that sounds like a really good idea. So again, my parents said no. Wouldn't let me go. Wouldn't let me do it. And again, I was, I was furious. Had no, could not understand how they can do such a thing. How can you do this? When everybody else's parents, every, you know, every, it wasn't everybody else, but you know, at the time it was everybody else's parents, they all let them go. I thought I knew it all, but they did the right thing, and it was for my benefit. And I couldn't understand it at the time. I really couldn't understand how much they actually loved me and cared for me at the time. 
I thought it was the worst thing in the world. I mean, I really did. I never thought, like, like, it took me so many years later to be able to reflect on that and look back and realize, you know what? My parents really did love me. They really did care about, they cared about me enough to be able to say no when I was able to, when I was throwing the worst fits, you know, and, and making them feel horrible for their decision and doing everything that I could to try to guilt them. That shows you, that proves to me how much they actually cared by being able to stand their ground and say no. As I was growing up, I had a couple of friends that had parents, or usually a parent, because most of my friends had, came from split homes. And unfortunately, you know, the, the split homes, their family life wasn't nearly as good as the people who had parents there together. But um, they had a parent that would let them drink alcohol, drink booze, get drunk as long as they would stay home. And they allow them to invite their friends over, right? So the thing for me when, when, when we were young is, hey, we're going over to so-and-so's house, right? Just tell your parents, oh, yeah, I'm going to spend the night at, at a friend's house. I'm going over here. I'm going over there. And we go over to this guy's house and, and have a party, right? And everything was good because his parents would even go out and buy the alcohol for us. They'd provide the booze as long as we just stayed there. Everything was good. Great parents, right? Great life. Well, at the time, I thought it was great. Hey, we could hang out. We could get drunk. We could play cards. We could have all this fun. But I realized, I actually didn't take me that long to realize how much better it was having parents that wouldn't let me do those things. The, the, you know, the time that I spent over there and when you walk in the house, the filth in the house because they allowed such a lifestyle to go on, the holes that were just punched in the wall that were just never fixed, the fights that would go on, the, the disgusting bathroom people be vomiting in. And, you know, this is a house where they're raising children. It was always just screaming all the time, completely dysfunctional. And you start to realize that and you say, you know what? Yeah, this may seem fun to me at the time, but I'm glad I don't live here. And that's what happens. And, and that's a family where, you know, the parents are thinking that, oh, they're, you know, they're being buddy-buddy with their kids and they, they think they, you know, love them so much when they hate them. You know, it's not a, that's not an environment for a child to be in. But see, when I was younger, it was a lot harder to see that. I still didn't have the wisdom and the understanding at the time. I just thought it was cool. I thought it was fun. I thought it was great. If I could choose my parents... When I was young, if you could line up just a whole bunch of parents, just people I knew, and just say, you know, choose who you would want to live with. Who would you want to be your parents? I would have made the wrong choice, 100%. I, I definitely would have made the wrong choice. I would have gone with the most permissive, the most do whatever you want, the most out of my life, the most just let me do whatever I want to do. That's what I would have chosen as a child, and I would have been a fool. It was a foolish choice because I don't know any better. I wouldn't have liked all the rules. I wouldn't have liked the discipline. I would have wanted parents that would just let me do what I wanted to do. And I would have ended up cho choosing parents that didn't love me. Turn if you go to 1 Peter chapter 1. We're talking about the benefits of being born again. We're born into a family. And thank God we're born into a family with a God that loves, a father that loves us. You know, the father has rules for us. The Father cares about what we do with our life. The Father's going to say no when we want to do some things that maybe we want to think feel good in our flesh. The Father's going to say no to a lot of things. But it's because He loves us. And we need to understand that. We need to realize that the Bible is not here to just restrict you and keep you back and withhold from you and make your life miserable. It's for your benefit. The rules that I have for my children, it's for their benefit. It's for their good. I don't want them getting their faces just stuck in their devices all the time. It's not good for them. It's going to in inhibit their learning capabilities. It's going to inhibit their imagination. It's going to inhibit their thinking skills by just having these, these things that's flashing in front of their face all the time. I'm not going to let them just eat whatever they want. I'm not going to let them eat all the sugar and all the snacks and all the candy and all the junk because it's not good for their bodies. It's going to make them unhealthy. In the long run, it's going to be very bad for them. They're going to be miserable. They're not going to want to have these diseases in 10, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years as a result of what I did to them when they were young. When you're young, you don't always understand those things. And honestly, 
in God's eyes, you think about the amount of wisdom that he has, we're pretty young, spiritually. Now, we're all at different stages and levels, but I'll tell you what, no matter what stage you're at, compared to God, we're all very young. We're all very young, and we need to realize that and have the faith enough to say, I don't know everything, but I know that God is true, and I know that God loves me, and I know that God cares about me and, and, and wants what's best for me. So I'm just going to listen to what he has to say. If my own children can understand that, that mom and dad love them. Because it's not just rules at our house, right? I mean, obviously there's a lot of other things that go on that we prove and we show them that we, that we love them. I mean, you ask any of my kids if, if mom and dad love them, I guarantee you they'll say yes. And it's not because they're afraid that dad's going to beat them if they say no. There's nothing to do with that because that would never happen anyways. They, they, you ask every single one, they love their parents because we show that to them. We, we make it known, we make it evident by the things that we do for them and, and everything else, but there's also rules. We need to understand, hey, there's a lot of things that God does for us. First of all, recognize those and, and understand the love that God has for us and then have the faith to say, God does care about me. God does love me. God does want what's best for me. So I'm just going to, even if I don't understand it, I'm just going to do what he says because I believe that he actually cares about me and cares about my best interests. One of the benefits of being a son is there's an inheritance. Benefits of being born again. You're born into God's family, there's an inheritance. 1 Peter chapter 1, look at verse number 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. What an amazing God for you. Reserved in heaven for you. God has a place. He has a spot. He has an inheritance. It's laid up for you. He cares about you. He wants you to have something. And after you get through this life, just you're kept by the power of God through faith in Jesus Christ. You're kept. He keeps you ready to be real the last time. And he gives you an inheritance because you're born into his family. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Another reference to what we have to look forward to of our inheritance being a son and how we, and, and the Bible even tells us here that basically we, we still can't understand and we won't understand what it's going to be like until we're there. We, we, this, this is one of those things that we have no comprehension of. The same way I was saying I didn't know what it was like to really be a father until I had a child. This is one of those things that you won't have any idea how great it is. And it is, it, you know, being a father is great. Amen, fathers out there. A Amen. Being a father is awesome. It's a wonderful blessing. It's great news. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse number 6. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the, of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. We have no idea what God has prepared for us. The things that God has made available to those that love him, he says, it's, it's unimaginable. You have no idea what it's going to be like until you finally get there. Turn, if you would, to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. You know, the Bible says that we, that we are and we're created for His pleasure, for God's pleasure. We, we're here to bring pleasure unto God. And, and I'll tell you what, I know as a father... I love when I can do things for my children that please them. It brings me a lot of pleasure. Now, God, and don't get me wrong about this, you know, it's not that God is just there for us. 
right? Like, like for our benefit. But there is a pleasure derived from your children being pleased, from doing things for your children because you love them, to show them that you love them. There have been times where I've done things here, because here it says, you know, I have not seen or ear heard, neither entered in the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. There have been times where I've prepared things for my children secretly without them knowing. Why? Because I want to see the looks on their faces. I want to see how excited they get. I want to see what happens. I want to see how much they love what I've prepared for them. God has done that for us. He's prepared a place for us. And I, I mean, I can't wait until we get in, able to see that place. That's going to bring pleasure unto God. Look at John chapter 14, verse number 1. Let not your hearts be troubled. And again, this is supposed to be an encouraging sermon this morning. We're, we're looking at the benefits of being born again. We're taking a step back from listening about all the things that we need to be aware of and watch out for and the wickedness in the world because it's very relevant. It's very there. You know, it's trouble. There's things we have to look out for. But let's just take a step back and just look at who we are and what we got to look forward to. Look at uh, John 14, 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. God's got a place prepared for us. Jesus went. He left to go prepare a place. He's like, I'm going. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And guess what? I'm going to come back for you. I'm not going to leave you behind. I'm coming back. Turn, if you would, to 1 John. 1 John chapter number 3. The other benefit of being born again, for one, you're a son. And the benefit of being a son is you have an inheritance. God has laid up a home for you in heaven. You've got a heavenly home. He's got a man, and it's not just a, a, a bungalow. He's got a mansion. He's got mansions set up for you to stay in because he loves you. He cares about you. He's, he's going to provide for you, not just here, but in, in eternity. But the other benefit is that when you're born again, you're born into a family. You have brethren. You have brothers and sisters. You have other people who were spiritually born again. And it's a pretty big family. There are many of us out there. It's, it's going to be way bigger than any physical family you have. Being part of this spiritual family. Brothers and sisters in Christ. Look at 1 John chapter 3. First John chapter 3, verse 16. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because He laid down His life for us. That's how we know, that's how we see God's love, is because He laid down His life. He was willing to give His entire life for you. Think about that. God, the God of Father in heaven, came down to this earth to give His life a ransom, to give His life for you, because He loves you. And we ought to lay down our lives, look at this, for the brethren, for one another, for other people. This is the family that we're a part of. And this is what we're supposed to do as family members is to be able to lay down our lives for each other. That's how much we ought to love other brothers and sisters in Christ, that we would lay down our lives for them, for each other. That's a lot of love. That's a strong family. That's a, that's, that's a great bond to have there with other believers. Look at chapter 4, 1 John chapter 4, verse number 7. 1 John 4, 7, Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. Herein is love. Not that we love God, but He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. Jump down to verse number 20. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. This is the way that God runs his house. He's saying that, you know what, if you love me, then you better love your family. You better love your brothers and sisters. You need to love them the same way that I love you. That's the way God's family works. And this is the way that God says the family is ought to be. Uh, go to chapter 5, John, 1 John chapter 5, verse 1. 
Bible reads, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone, everyone that loveth him that begat, loveth him also that is begotten of him. Everyone that loves God that, that, that has begotten you, your spiritual birth, it says everyone loves him also that is begotten of him. You, need to, you love your brothers and sisters in Christ also. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. They're all tied together. God's love for us, his commandments. You know, why do we preach the commandments so much? Because we love God. Because we love each other. We want to show God our love for him. We want to disobey him and keep his commandments. We respect God. The same way that my children respect me when they obey my commandments, when they listen to what I have to say for them. But the commandments are good. They're not grievous. Thank God we have a Father that loves us enough to give us rules. So the law is something else that we could be thankful for by being spiritually born again, born into this family. There is a law. There's a law that's given by a righteous lawgiver. We have a lot of laws today in this world. Anyone could make a law. I mean, you know, humanly speaking, there's a lot of wicked people out there that make wicked laws because it, it benefits them because they receive money for it. They, they get special interests you know, going into their pockets that give them a lot of money in order to pass laws that are going to be bad for certain people and good for others and give people benefits and give people, you know, that's the way that, that, that humans make laws. But God is perfect and God is just and God is righteous and God has made laws that benefit us. It's not a, they're, not, they're not bad for us. If we were able to perfectly follow God's commands, we would have the most fulfilling and joyful life possible. We really would. If, if, if we were capable of following everything that God did for us, our lives would be, have, have the most sense of accomplishment and, and, and completeness and joy possible. But people that lack wisdom will say that's not true. It's more joyful to live a life of sin. It's more joyful to just go out and do whatever I want to do. But... That is not the truth, and it's evident. You can see it in the world. If you open up your eyes, you can see it in the world today. Look at the people that have everything. Talk to them. A lot of them will put on a front that people might think that they're happy, yet they're going through all these divorces, yet they're on drugs, they're addicted to, to alcohol and drugs, and, and they're ending up killing themselves or, or dying in a... In a you know, overdosing and all these other things. Why? Because they're not happy at all. Because they have no joy. They have everything. They have fame. They have fortune. They have all this stuff. You can see it. And, and look, it's not a coincidence. I mean, it, look at how many of the people die young. Look at the rock stars. Look at the movie stars. Look at the, anyone who is lifted up and has all this money and has everything that the world has to offer. Look closely at their lifestyle. Do you really think that they're happy? Is that really bringing them joy? Is that really bringing them peace? It's not. If you're honest with yourself, it's not. You'll know that it's not. When you start going after money as a source for your contentment or for your happiness, it's never going to be enough, ever. And it's going to eat you up and inside. You could have as much, all the goods and all this stuff, it's never going to be enough for you. There's still going to be something missing. It is, it is vanity. It's meaningless. The more you get, the more you're going to realize this is stupid. This stuff is meaningless. And what it is, it's a big facade. You know, all the, this big commercial world that we live in, oh, you need to have this. This is the best thing. It's sliced bread. This is awesome. You need to have this gadget. You need to have this tool. You need to have this boat. You know, and, and make things look so fun. You see, the th you see the little video clips. Man, that looks awesome. And then you go and do it. It's like, well, it was all right. That was pretty fun. And you forget about it and move on. And if you could just fill your life with all that stuff, you're going to realize very quickly it's empty. There's nothing really there. But when you've got a father that loves you, that's looking out for you and wants you to avoid the, the pitfalls and the traps and the, the, the things that are actually going to bring you um, more sorrow and more grief than actual joy, that will give you contentment and true contentment where you're not going to care about all the other things of this world. And then when you start to realize that, hey, we get, you, know, you, could, you could work real hard and gather and accumulate all these toys and all these goods and, and, and fill up my house and get this really big house and have all this stuff, and then you realize one day you're just going to die anyways and that stuff's going to be burned up and it's just going to be gone 
It's going to decay. It's going to rot. It's going to come to nothing. Everything is going to happen like that. Everything goes away. And one day, you're not even going to be here anymore. But when you realize that, you know what, this isn't my home anyways. I have a home in heaven. I've got a much better home. I've got a mansion built up there. I've got a place that God himself has prepared for me. You got something to look forward to. You got something to realize, hey, this is eternal. This is enduring. That does not corrupt. That does not get old. That is not going to be destroyed. So why live for the things of this world right now? It's here for a moment. It's gone. Turn if you go to Luke chapter 15. The benefit of being born again. We're you know, a son. We have inheritance. We have brethren. We have brothers and sisters that, that, that are supposed to love us enough and we're supposed to love them enough to, to lay down our own lives for them. We have that type of a family. We have a, a father that loves us enough to give us rules, to look out for us, to try to protect us, to try to guard us, to try to help us to get in the right path and, and to teach us right from wrong. I mean, that's what the law is. It's telling you, this is wrong, don't do it. This is right, do it. I mean, that's really what it is. It's instruction. It's telling us, don't do these because this could be really bad for you. I mean, really, how bad is it? Don't, you know, don't steal. Yeah, it's pretty good words to live by. What's going to happen if you, if you become a thief and start stealing from people? Someone's going to get really angry and it's going to come back to you. And that won't be good for you. What happens if you, you know, like to commit adultery? Hey, don't commit adultery. Yeah, one day you're going to get caught and that woman's husband's going to find you and shoot your brains out. And it's not going to be good for you. Or something, you're going to cause some other problems in your life. The, the, the rules that God has given us to follow. You know, don't get drunk. Why? Because your eyes are going to, you you're, you're, you're I was going to behold strange women and your heart's going to utter perverse things. You're going to say perverted things. You're going to say stupid things. You're going to say things that get yourself in trouble. You're going to be sick and vomiting and, and laying on some disgusting bathroom floor somewhere. And, and, you know, who knows what might happen to you? Who knows who might defile you? These are good rules to live by. Okay, God's looking out for you. He's like, oh man, God just won't let me have any fun. Look, I've been there. When it comes to the alcohol, it's, it's not what it's cracked up to be at all. At all. It does only bring an empty feeling and misery and sorrow and shame. You do things that are shameful when you're drunk. Luke chapter 15. Benefit, though, of, of being born again is the mercy and the grace that we receive from a loving father. A loving Heavenly Father who truly loves you has so much mercy and grace. We screw up. We do things that are wrong. We, we sin. We, we, we have problems in our life. But God loves us. And God has grace and mercy and He's there for us. And once you're born again, see, God doesn't have unconditional love for everybody because you must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ in order to be saved, in order to become a part of His family, in order to be born into His family. You need to do that. You need to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior. But once you do that, you do have unconditional love from the Father. Why? He's never going to cast you out of the family. He's never going to leave you or forsake you. He's never going to send you to hell when you die. He is going to take you home no matter what. That is a loving Father. A Father that is able to say, even if you disobey everything that I tell you to do, everything and make me you know disappointed and ashamed of you because of the way that you behave yourself at the end of the day i still love you i'm going to take you home that is a loving and merciful and gracious father to have we see an example of that in the parable here in luke chapter 15 so the parable of the prodigal son look at verse number 11 and he said a certain man had two sons and the younger of them said to his father father give me the portion of goods that fall to me and he divided unto them his living and again, in this story, the Father represents the Lord. He's the Heavenly Father. This is, this is a representation. And His sons are that. They're His sons. They're people who are born into His family. So they represent the believers who are born into God's family. And look at what happens here. Verse 13. And not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. He got as far away as he could from his dad. 
from the things that his dad taught, the things that his dad said. Didn't want to listen to what his dad had to say. He went far away and just did his own thing. Partied it up. He lived it up, right? Riotous living. Oh, man, it's going to be great. Verse 14, And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Yeah, and all of a sudden, things aren't going so well. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. So in order to get by now, he wasted all that he had. Everything his, his dad gave it to him, he wasted it. Now he's got to feed the pigs in order to just get by, in order to feed himself. He's got to go out. This is his job to go out and feed the pigs. Verse 16, And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. Now he finds himself in a, in a really bad place because he's looking at the, the slop, the pig food that he's given them, and he's just saying, man, if I could just eat that. His job is to feed that to the pigs. They say, no, you can't eat that. That's for the pigs. And he's looking at that and just, just lusting after their food. That's how hungry he is. That's, that's how low he's gotten in his point of getting away from his father. Look at verse 17. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? Things are great at my dad's house. I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. Look at this. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. As soon as he made that decision, he said, You know what? I'm going to go back to dad's house. What does dad do? Did his dad hold it over his head? Did his dad say, see, I told you so. Why did you go and do all this? Why do you go? He learned his lesson. He knew, he figured out what it's like to be away from the father. He sees him afar off. One, that shows you he's looking for him. I think the father was looking for his son to come back every single day because he loved him. He ran. As soon as he saw him, he ran to him. He had compassion my son made a bad mistake, but you know what? I still love him. He ran to him, he fell on his neck, and he kissed him. Open arms, come back home, son. I'm glad you came back home. He said in verse 22, But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe, and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf, and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. That shows a loving, gracious, merciful father that truly loves their child, truly loves their son, waiting for him to come back. Turn, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 2. This is what we have being born again. You could make mistakes in your life. Does God want you to make mistakes in your life? No. Does he have rules and commandments for you to follow? Yes. Should we follow them? Yes. If this man would have just stayed at home and did what his father told him to do, would things have been much better in his life? Of course they would. Of course they would. That's the right way. That he should have stayed at home like his brother did. But he chose the wrong path. But did God just say, did the father just say, well, no, you made your choice. You're gone. Get out of here. No. No. He was still looking for him to come back. He came back and was welcomed with open arms. That is a loving father. That is a merciful and gracious father. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 1. <clears throat> Ephesians 2, verse 1. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. So without God, we're dead. Our own sins condemn us. We've broken God's law. We were dead in trespasses and sins, but God still loved us. God loved us enough to send His only begotten Son to die on the cross for us and to pay for our sins. That loving, gracious, merciful Father in heaven. You don't deserve it. But He loves you and He did it anyways. Verse 2, Wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, 
fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. We are naturally children of wrath. We naturally have a sinful flesh body that drives us into sin. But, verse 4, but God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead and in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. God loves you. God loves you in words that cannot be expressed. We need to remember that. Amen. Yes, we're in a spiritual battle. Yes, we get in war mode. Yes, we always have a fight going on. But don't ever forget how much God loves you and cares about you and everything that he's done for you and what he has prepared for you. Every family has its problems. Every family, even God's family, at least while we're here on this earth. When those hard times come, just remember that your membership alone in that family guarantees you the love of your father. Just being a member of the family, just being a member of God's family, God loves you. God is merciful. God is faithful. God's words stand when God says something, he won't back down from it. He won't, he won't ever lie. Men may lie to you. I know there's, there's, uh, there's people who, who have grown up maybe in, in families, and I'm not necessarily anyone here, but people have grown up in families where they didn't have a good mother or a good father. They had parents that let them do whatever they wanted. They didn't have rules for them. They, they, they may have told them things and lied to them. They may have made promises to them and backed out of their promises. They may have been horrible parents that didn't actually love their kids. But you know what? If that's the case, if you're born again, you're born in God's family, that's not who God is. God keeps his word. God loves you. God's merciful. God's gracious. And he cares about you. And he says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11, it is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Salvation is all about faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how you get saved. Now, my personal favorite verse in the whole Bible is John 5, 24. When Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Those are words that cannot be broken. Those are words that are true as the day is long. Those words cannot go back. He will not go back on his words. God is true to everything that he says, and he doesn't change his mind. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Okay, those words stand. So when we see here, even in 2 Timothy 2, and look, being born again is so easy. It's a free gift by putting your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He says that even if you stop believing, you've already received the free gift. You've already put your faith in Christ. He says, if we believe yet, yet he abideth faithful. Faithful. He is faithful to his word. He cannot go back. He says he cannot deny himself. Once he's said something, it's done. It's, oh, it's, this is the way it is. You have everlasting life. That means forever. Once he's given it to you, it's yours forever. There is no taking back. There is no going back from there. He's faithful. Being able to rely on. You know, physically in this world, people fail. You may look to your, to your mom or to your dad and, and rely on them. And you ought to. You ought to be able to, at least. But sometimes we fail. God never fails. Amen. We could rely on our Heavenly Father for everything without fail. That is some good news. 
Everyone that is born again has a heavenly father that loves them more than they will ever know. More than you will ever know. We have a father that has rules for us because he loves us. We have a father that is merciful. Thank God for that. We have a father that was willing to give his life for us. We have a father that has prepared a wonderful place for us. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for who you are. We thank you for saving our wicked souls, dear God. We thank you for giving us that free gift of salvation. We thank you for our eternal life. God, help us as we, as we struggle with our, with our battles and in the, in the, in the daily fights that we have and this flesh that's driving us to, to sin and, and to get us into trouble, dear Lord. As we have all these problems and we have all these struggles, struggles, dear God, I pray that you would please help us to be able to just take comfort and just to remember whose family we're in and who you are. God, help us never to be forgetful of that. Help us to take strength and encouragement in that so that we can continue to move forward, that we could realize and have the faith that, hey, this home, this, this place is not our home. This world is not our home, dear God. We're just passing through. We're just, we're just waiting to get to what you've prepared for us. And in the meantime, we're going to do what you've told us to do, and we're going to work hard as your children that we could actually try to live up to your name and that we could live up to our word. We could see how much that you are faithful and true to your words, dear Lord. Help us to be faithful and true to the things that we say and the things that we do. Help us to have the love towards others that you had towards us, that we could truly love and care about one another, our brothers, our sisters in Christ, dear Lord, as well as the sinners and the, and the unsaved, dear God. Help us to be able to go out and bring the love that you have for them. God, we love you. We thank you. It's in Jesus Christ's holy name we pray. Amen.